welcome to the show. Thank you. Oh, nice. um, tell me about cryotherapy. I know it's mm. been around for a while, but you, you, your company seems to really mm. um, uh, you know, specialize in this. Right. Tell me about it. Yeah, so this started sort of in 1978. There was a Japanese rheumatologist that wanted to find a treatment for his patients that had severe rheumatoid arthritis. So we're talking inflammatory, um, an inflammatory disorder, right? An autoimmune inflammatory disorder. And he came up with um, <clears throat> this uh, extreme cold temperature treatment that once you reach a cryogenic threshold, he discovered, the body, you know, especially the layers of the skin that get flash frozen from this cold temperature, release anti-inflammatory proteins. And it works really very efficiently to treat severe illnesses like, you know, autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis. And that's how it started. Then we came, became interested in, I was actually working uh, in geriatrics for a while and uh, wanted to get out of that. Every person in America, unfortunately, I mean, I, I love the patients, but the overwhelming majority of these patients are on a massive amount of medications and especially for pain modulation and other things. So I was looking really for non-pharmacologic um, applications and I thought initially this would be my my patient base. Turns out that's only a small part now, right? Um, and then while Emilia, my, uh, my girlfriend at the time, was doing an internship in Germany, she did um, a sample in a cryotherapy place, one of the newest ones in, in Berlin they had. And um, I came along, you know, I, I was visiting Germany at the time, you know, I was living in the US. And so it's the first time I saw it. And then I, uh, I, I was hooked. I thought it was amazing. Did more research and brought, and we together brought the first machine over here. Now, how long, uh, and I've, I've been mm -hmm. in your center and I've tested it. And how long is the results uh, that you have to go six months or what mm -hmm. is the best results? It varies what you're doing it for. So if you have an acute injury, uh, even a few treatments are fine. We have, interestingly, um, a large majority of people coming in just because they feel so much more, they, they feel their metabolism pick up so much, they're more functional. And these are people that are not chronically ill. But if you are chronically ill, let's say you have, in a severe case, rheumatoid arthritis, and we have many patients with that, um, then regular treatments, we'd say about three, four times a week. And I would say after the first one to two weeks, even, you start feeling a lot better. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and the cold actually brings the inflammation down, right? Yes, and it's not like, and as people always bring this up, they confuse cold with other modalities, like an ice bath. An ice bath is a very different modality. I like ice baths or cold plungers, I've done them. They don't work at this level. So this, we're talking here about an extremely potent anti-inflammatory treatment. I'll give you an example. We have a patient with severe rheumatoid arthritis, and she has pretty much over her life failed all uh, available treatments. You know, there's immunosuppressive therapy like Humira, you might have heard about, Scalara, all these things, and then there's corticosteroids. So nothing really worked anymore. She was worsening and um, came to cryo, this was years ago already, and has done regular treatments three, four times a week. She is now off all medications in, in, in a remission state, so this doesn't go away, but she's in remission for many years now with normal blood levels. And that doesn't happen in ice bath. You have to go to a cryogenic temperature, in my opinion, at least negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And we go a bit colder than that. And, and um, also, what I love about your center or your centers, you have mm -hmm. so many different variations of holistic uh, modalities. And I, I've done the infrared light therapy. Mm -hmm. Tell me more. I know, uh, you know you have several YouTubes about it. But yeah. for someone who's a novice and doesn't right. know, you know, they may think it's a tanning bed. Yeah, yeah. You know? Looks like it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is an interesting treatment. I also came across this. Um, uh, I read a few studies on it, and it was pretty fascinating. When you look at red light, visible light, the spectrum, as you go to the longer wavelength end of what we can see as light, that's red, right? From red, you go to near infrared. You can't see that anymore. So from anywhere from 620 to 680 or 700 nanometers, that's red, you can see. After about 700 or 720 nanometers, near infrared, you can't see. But these light frequencies actually, and you think of wavelengths here, right? 
can penetrate into the body. Other light doesn't do that really. But red light and your infrared goes uh, into your skin, which is the red light you can see that goes into the layers of the skin and the dermis and subdermis, right? And then near infrared can go inch and a half, two inch deep in your tissue and actually penetrates bone. And it's been, it's fantastic. These bo Both these, these light waves, they kind of work on mitochondria in our cells. We think of them as the powerhouses. But what they do essentially, one of the main effects is they um, allow the mitochondria to produce more melatonin. The same thing we think of for sleep. But here, if it's produced in the mitochondria, it helps with mitochondrial health and function. And it can take cells that are in oxidative stress about to die and revive them this way. And it's tested right now and actually used already even in brain diseases like um, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's dementia, because again, it goes through the skull to the brain and allows these neurons in the brain to become more functional again and reverse some of the symptoms and some of the ideology we have with Alzheimer's even. So would you say that it's sort of a planting of the seeds of what you have, your cells that are dying, it helps to regenerate them or keep the longevity of them by the light uh, infrared? Yeah, it makes them healthier again. So the thing is, one thing that I came across more and more when I read these studies, so I'll do videos about it, Mitochondrial health, right, is that something that we know more and more is really important because it seems that that's at the root of all diseases. And um, you think of cancer, one of the diseases that's very scary, obviously, that we was thinking about. We always thought about, well, this is manifesting because we have um, problems with the genetic material. The DNA in the nucleus has some problems, right? You have mutations in there, and that is the manifestation of a cell that has an uncontrolled division cycle. But it turns out, actually, that it starts in the mitochondria because they've done tests with these cells where they had a cancer cell, and they put in a healthy nucleus with healthy DNA, and it continued to be a cancer cell, and vice versa. They had a healthy cell. They put a cancer nucleus in there with cancer DNA, and that cell um, stayed healthy. So the mitochondria seemed to be the more predominant part of the health of the cell even there. And when we can do something to improve our mitochondrial health, and LED, red light, and near-infrared is one of those modalities. Others are uh, glutathione, uh, you know, or the replenishment of glutathione. These are all important things there. We can actually, um, one, prevent, which is really what I'm interested in, but also we can also treat, right? And and also the um, you know the the glutathione and the B twelve mm -hmm. and the um, vitamin yeah. D. Uh, I mean, what what's so yeah. great is people don't know that you can maybe take injections of those to help mm -hmm. benefit or boost. Right. Um, what is the benefit of um, of of, of because it's mind, body, spirit. Yeah, yeah. So you have to find the balance. And how yeah. do you know if your energies are off? That's the thing. How do people say, how, how, <clears throat> do, do, how do I go to a cryotherapy and what, do I need it right. really? I think the interesting thing here is even if you do, let's say you do a cryotherapy session or you do an LED bed session, you know, if when you're treating something, one session might not be sufficient, but you can tell after the first time you were there how you feel. And they use usually a pretty big impact. If you are sick or if you have um, a deficiency, then doing these modalities will make you feel a lot better. And the more regularly you do it, the more lasting it is. Again, for short-term injuries, you may not need a lot of sessions. But um, one thing is if you're chronically sick or so, then we offer, again, these like um, packages for the whole month. And it becomes actually very reasonable. I think our cryo comes down to $12 a treatment. If you have a monthly unlimited, that's actually very, very reasonable. But like you said, so, so having deficiencies as we age is more prevalent, especially with vitamins. Uh, most of, when you think about vitamins, need to be absorbed when you take them orally in, in your digestive tract. And as we get older, that absorption is massively uh, decreasing, especially for things like vitamin B12. And then Injecting it, you bypass that, right? You give it an intramuscular shot, goes from there into the bloodstream. You're bypassing the digestive tract, so you have full absorption. And you can see then, you know, if you improve, I always recommend if you do a modality at our place, do one at a time. Because if there is a change and you do a bunch of things while you're there, we don't know what actually worked for you. So I think it's good to be, you know, conservative at first and say, well, let's try this out. If you have a blood test, we can look at that. We can also do testing in our facility. We do blood tests as well. So I do some primary care there as well. And we can see if you're low on, on certain vitamins, for example. Also, also, um, I do the Beamer. Yeah. Talk to me about the Beamer, because many yeah. people I've tried to explain what it yeah. is, and they go, 
Is that like a magnet thing? What is it right. all about? Explain to the to, to the audience what that yeah. is. And then that, that was my first reaction when I heard about it. So any modality, by the way, that we're using is something that I have to wanting and, and, and that I'm using myself because otherwise I would be a bit of a hypocrite to have it. This one, I, I wasn't convinced at first. And then I looked at the studies. They were great and uh, tried it out and had some amazing effects from this. So this is a PEMF device, pulsating electromagnetic field. So essentially, it's a magnetic um, field that you're on that has a certain weight wavelength, signature wavelength that they designed. It is not a very strong field, but you can feel it while you're on there. And the only thing it really does, it dilates capillary beds. And what it means is the very small blood vessels in your tissue, it allows the blood to go further. It allows to oxygen to go further than it usually goes, right? Because it widens those. And when you think of red blood cells, they have a certain size. They transport oxygen. They pick up CO2. Then you have waste products. And then you have your immune system, your white blood cells that need to get in there as well. And if these cells are chronically uh, constricted, you can't get in there. So what the Beamer does, it opens up these beds and allows better perfusion. And with that come all the effects that it has. It sounds a bit like snake oil because it has so many benefits. But when you think about your oxygenated tissue, you are uh, picking up more CO2, you're allowing your immune system to go to places where it usually cannot go. And that's how it has such a tremendous effect on the body. So I think it's a fantastic treatment. Um, think of hyperbaric oxygen chambers. We don't offer that. That is like an hour and a half, usually in a slightly higher pressure, higher oxygen environment. The idea there is high pressure, you're dissolving oxygen in the liquid, in the plasma of your blood, right? And because plasma, even if you have constricted capillary beds, can go over there, so it's just a liquid, you have oxygen carrying that way. The Beamer does it by dilating them, allowing the red blood cells carrying oxygen to go to those places. That's the difference, right? And I noticed that um, when I'm consistent yeah. with the Beamer, uh, I can feel the change slowly you can yeah. feel it especially traveling a lot um mm. but i also what i love about your work is that you are consistent in about talking about food and and mm -hmm. you know and i know you have so many youtubes and people should watch them about you know about the salt yeah. You know, and about how important the salt is that the table salt is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, one of them. So I think food is crucial. And you th we think of, so my interest really is preventive medicine. And um, one of the best ways to start is, you know, the, the things we put into our body, right? Uh, and unfortunately, our diet, again, is terrible. We have processed foods, we have uh, contaminants, we have toxins that we consume on a regular basis. And our government agencies are not very good at really um, cutting out things that are harmful for us because there, there seem to be too much uh, monetary interest back and forth. There seem to be, you know, again, I, we, I would like to see a bit more of a clear guideline for people. But um, having changes in your nutrition is one of the best things you can do for improving your health long term, right? And going to simple ingredients, uh, whole ingredients, things that are not sprayed with pesticides, herbicides, like simple stuff, right? Cutting out things that are uh, full of heavy metals or plastic components. I talk a lot about plastic and, and water and other, and other things. And there's things that are not that difficult to do and they shouldn't be too expensive to do. I think it's more an understanding of, well, what is, what is out there that does harm? Because a lot of times I didn't know either. Uh, in medical school, I had about a handful of nutrition lectures and um, we didn't talk about a lot of environmental toxins. You talk about what you do with a sick patient coming in, right? Now my interest is more, well, how do you prevent someone from getting sick? You know, because I think that's the better way to approach it, also the less lucrative way in the medical business, but I think it's the more important way. Were you, was there a catalyst that mm. you said, I want to change, or you saw that there was such a need, or what was, what was yeah. your, moment where you said, I want mm. to do longevity? So really it is working in the geriatric, uh, in, in, geri in geriatrics with elderly people and seeing, um, again, everybody has about 15 to 20 medications at, when, they're, when they're 80 or 85. <laughs> Most of them I would argue they will not need. And it is interesting how the whole system is geared towards getting us hooked on chronic medication and we are very reluctant to decrease them. And that was kind of my job back then, which I liked, you know, going in saying, hey, does this person need this? Um, but, you know, again, going there, is that really the solution? Do we need to treat with so many medications or can we do changes that are non-pharmacologic in nature? And of course, there can be, uh, there can be medications to support. The interesting thing here that we see in, uh, in Western medicine is one or the other, right? You can have either 
you go full pharmacologic and you know Western medicine, which which I studied. I went to UCLA for medical school, or you go in holistic, non non medication, food based. Right? I think they should work hand in hand. I think we should have both available. There are medications that are fantastic and are needed, but many medications are over prescribed, and it is the issue we have is that our medical system is a business. And when medicine becomes a business, especially in the pharma industry, you, I can't blame the pharma industry, they try to make money and that's what they're set out to do, right? But it sometimes does not work in the interest of the patient. Well, it also, you start to see how um, people really now have to be their own health advocates mm -hmm. um, because I believe in all the holistic medicines, yeah. Chinese medicine, you know, I've done for many years, acupuncture, cupping. Mm. And I um, recently had to have a test done on my stomach. Um, and I spoke to the, you know, the doctor, big scientific doctor, and she and she's Chinese. And I said, mm. what about these modalities? And, you know, you're Chinese. Yeah. Don't you do these Teas and I said yeah. I go and I drink these teas and I get the cupping and I do the. She said, "Oh no 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 P prescriptions." And I'm like, right. "No no 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 no." <laughs> she just said both. I mean that's the thing. Uh, look at green tea. I did a video about it. Uh, green tea has an active ingredient called EGCG, which is amazing. Uh, it has a lot of anti-cancer properties. Right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Studies in Japan have shown that you know people that drank about ten of these uh, cups of tea, the smaller cups than ours of green tea had a lower incidence of cancer when you've compared in the population. So we know these things do work. We know there's there are active ingredients and we know these are things that do not have a lot of side effects, but there's reluctance. And the reluctance is because as physicians, we are, whether we like it or not, we're influenced by the pharma industry, right? And the pharma industry, of course, it's in their interest to say, well, don't use anything that's not a prescription. We have the better studies and the better research and the publications, and that's absolutely true, they do. But that's because there's a lot of money involved, right? There's patents. And when you think about, I mean, do you know, is, is there a patent on green tea? Of course not, because again, these are natural ingredients. And then is in whose interest is it to do a multi-million dollar double blind placebo controlled uh, study on a particular uh, you know, aspect of these active ingredients? That is the issue that why we don't a lot of times have good studies on either cheap medications or repurposed medications, and there's some very good ones as well, or on natural ingredients of foods, right? But we do have a lot of studies for a lot of money on new patentable pharmaceut pharmaceuticals, right? And I'm not saying all of them are bad. Some of them are good. But, but if you think about it, at some point, you're running out of things to sell, and you have to fish a bit for new things, and new makes more money. That's true, but it's not always better. Also, also, um, do you find that um, with many patients that it's connected to the mental part mm -hmm. as far as the, uh, you know, I, I teach, uh, you know, positive affirmations yeah. and positive thinking, but if, if a person starts to concentrate on those yeah. aspects, they start in time feeling better and, yes. and looking more positive. Do you find when people take the cryotherapy and maybe they've been not so positive, but as they start to change mm -hmm. um, their mental state of mind, mm -hmm. that it helps to heal them quicker? I think very much so. In cryo is very interesting there because it has actually, so when you go to uh, studies published in Europe, um, there it is actually considered a medical modality, so you can use it in a medical setting. And one indication is major depressive disorder, right? So people that have depression, we know people with depression are more prone to disease. And that is, as you mentioned, actually, it is a state of mind. And uh, positive thinking versus negative thinking has been studied and been shown that if you are in a very negative mindset, you're thinking very negatively about your health all the time, you have a worse health outcome. And that is, you can, you can find studies that really document that. And that is another pet peeve of mine with our field in medicine, because we usually give the worst possible diagnosis to someone, you know, and that doesn't do anybody any favors, you know. We're always saying, like, well, in my experience, this will happen to you, you know. And a lot of times, we don't really know, because some people do better, some people do worse, you know. But you're right, if in a negative mind, a negative uh, thinking can greatly affect your health. And modalities like, you know, cry or beamer, when you come out of there, or the red light even, you can feel endorphins kicking in at a very high amount. You feel better. Uh, depressive symptoms 
uh, get better, get modulated at least, and sometimes go, go away even, right? And that impacts your health as well. So one is the physical changes and the changes on, on a cellular level and the release of anti-inflammatory proteins. The other one is the mental state. And I think they do work hand in hand. And, and I also uh, love that mm. you were speaking about how the red light can help anxiety mm. and depression. Is that yeah. because the endorphins are kicked in or is it all the all the um, mm. procedures help to yeah. stabilize the mind? So with the light therapy is really its direct effect on the brain, you know, because again, remember the um, wavelengths can penetrate tissue. Red light uh, only really uh, to the dermis, subdermis, uh, capillary beds and all these things. But then uh, near infrared just go through the skull, goes, goes through a bone into the brain. and you know, by um, really improving the health of your neurons in your brain, we feel that a lot of times anxiety improves because anxiety or all these things, they do have sometimes also a, when you want, like a, like a physical underlying, like uh, in the individual neurons in our brain. When we can improve brain health, a lot of times anxiety improves as well. What would your best uh, tip be for someone who wants to get healthy and meaning Right. mind, body, and, and soul, what would you suggest? I would really uh, investigate the things that chronically make you sick and avoid those first. I think that's the first step. And when you start with water, you know, drinking out of uh, plastic Plastic bottles. is bad. <laughs> it's just really bad. Um, <laughs> we just now found, I did a video on it, there's uh, nanoplastics, which they can identify now, 200,000 plastic particles, mostly nanoplastics, in a, a liter of water. That actually is so small, it penetrates uh, from the gut lining into a bloodstream, even goes to a brain. So these things, you gotta cut out. So and, and you can taste that. the difference. You can taste the difference, but things, and then people always ask, well, what's a good alternative? So start, in your, start with your consumption of water, because that's one of the most important uh, uh, nutrients we take in every day. Go with the reverse osmosis filter. In the morning, let it run for about one glass to flush the system, and then use that, right? Don't use plastic bottles. You drink out of stainless steel. Don't heat anything in plastic, so avoid all plastic as best you can. Have glass containers, stainless steel containers, ceramic cups. Do not drink hot beverages at Starbucks. These cups, they're paper, they're lined with plastic, otherwise they would leak out, right? And when you put a hot liquid in there, guess what happens? That dissolves more of the crap that's in there. We're talking phthalates and bisphenols. If they tell you it's uh, BPA-free, bisphenol A-free, then there's bisphenol S or F in there. So there's, again, I would avoid all that. So that's number one. Then in nutrition-wise, go to simple ingredients. Don't buy anything in a package, ideally. So go with single ingredients. You know, we're talking about eggs, uh, milk. Uh, we're talking about fruit and vegetables and even meat is fine. But when it's all packaged up and processed and you have a lot of processed foods in there, these are things that have stuff in there we don't want, like, you know, seed oils, it's gonna have uh, microplastics in there as well. It's gonna have a bunch of crap in there. So go with that, go with simple nutrition. Think think how people ate, let's say, 150 years ago. What did they buy in the, the grocery store, wherever they went? And uh, they were a bit healthier back, back then because they didn't have all these um, uh, chemicals we have today. They had less incidence of disease. They died from infection usually or uh, tuberculosis, which again, I'm glad we have antibiotics and other things today, right? But if you think, if it was okay 150 years ago, if that's what people ate, you're fine. If it's something that's very new, I would just not have it, like artificial sweeteners and food colorings, bad. Yep. Well, thank you for the health chat <laughs> with Doctor in the house. And if any of you would like to look him up further, you can go to his Instagram at Jonas.Kuehne.md. And you can check out uh, his cryotherapy uh, chambers at uh, his uh, three, three different locations in Los Angeles, if you happen to be in Los Angeles. But... Thank you so much. It's a, always a pleasure to see you and your wife, and you'll see me at your center more and more. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure being here. It yeah. was great. So thank you so much for joining me today on this special episode of Ready, Set, Live. Until next time, be well.